Yeah, welcome everyone to this round table. Um, this is a uh, somewhat open and interactive format. So we will be talking to each other. Um, yeah, I will be moderating mostly, uh, but the panelists here will talk to each other about uh, various issues surrounding large language models, everybody's favorite these days. Um, and yeah, we will also involve you, the audience. And during this uh, session, you're actually allowed your phones to have your phones. So, um, yeah, uh, that was too quick. I need to go back. Yeah, uh, please, everyone, use this QR code to enter uh, a little survey that will be that we'll be conducting. Um, yeah, should be working. At first, we're going to ask you a little question about who you are or um, what you do, basically, because we would like to see a little bit later on um, yeah, if that has any bearing on your uh, responses. Uh, and yeah, uh, the, the main purpose of this interactive element is that we would like to involve you uh, in the future of... Uh, yeah, how LLMs are going to be used uh, or made available inside Transcribus. So we would like you, the community, to inform the development, the future development of Transcribus in terms of large language models. Everyone ready with the QR code and the web link? We'll show it uh, another time later on when the actual questions come. So now... Yeah, um, this round table is going to be about large language models, as I've already said, uh, what's possible with them, how they're already being used in the field by the experts on the material. Uh, and yeah, what problems surround them um, implementation wise, uh, ethically, economically, ecologically. So there's a lot of stuff to discuss uh, around large language models. And yeah, let's take a look at the panelists who's uh, with us today. Um, the handsome gentleman in the middle is David Brown, who is joining us from Trinity College Dublin. And he has worked on delivering a series of high profile digital humanities projects, including the Down Survey of Ireland in 2013 and the Virtual Record Treasury of Ireland in 2022. He is the author of Empire and Empire, uh, Enterprise, uh, published in 2020, a study of early modern merchants in the Atlantic world, uh, along with numerous book chapters and journal articles. A strong believer in the beneficial use of generative AI as a practical research tool, David has been demonstrating these capabilities to librarians, archivists, and academics over the past year. So very active in promoting what can be done with um, large language models in the humanities community and memory institutions community. Then um, joining us from the Amsterdam City Archives, we have uh, Nick Verhoof, second on the left, stage left. Uh, yeah, who serves as a project manager for digital innovation at the Amsterdam City Archives focusing on automating workflows and integrating systems to streamline archival processes. Nick uh, spearheads uh, initiatives aimed at enhancing the efficiency and accessibility of archival resources. And his work involves leveraging cutting edge technologies to ensure that the vast collections of historical documents are preserved, digitized and made available to the public in more interactive and user-friendly formats. Um, yeah together with uh, his colleague, Pauline, uh, who's also joining us today. Uh, yeah, they, uh, their dedication to innovation positions the Amsterdam City Archives at the forefront of digital archiving and the preservation of cultural heritage for future generations. So a very uh, important institution uh, in this regard. And uh, we're happy to have two representatives of uh, yeah, this pioneer uh, institution. Uh, yeah, and uh, as I said, uh, yeah, 
Uh, also joining us is Nick's uh, colleague, uh, Pauline van den Heuvel, uh, who is an innovative archivist at the Amsterdam City Archives and leading the use of handwritten text recognition and large language models to digitize historical documents. Since uh, 2010, she's spearheaded uh, crowdsourced projects and from 2017, worked with volunteers using Transcribus for ground truth data, focusing on 17th and 18th century archives. Her aim is to make Amsterdam city archives fully searchable and globally accessible. So very much in line with what Transcribus is doing uh, or trying to achieve as well. Uh, yeah, and she wants to ensure AI aids, uh, yeah, uh, aid that AI aids rather than uh, replaces human effort. Pauline is uh, dedicated to improving HDR quality and exploring AI's role in archival work, striving to make historical insights more accessible. Then um, also among our guests is uh, Helene Wilbrink, joining us from uh, the Utrecht archives where she's a program manager. And uh, yeah, Helene focuses on enhancing digital accessibility of archival materials. Collaborating closely uh, with her colleagues, Helene works on the application of AI, specifically HDR and LLMs to unlock historical texts. One of her core interests is implementing linked open data to interconnect and share information seamlessly. If you remember, the, the generation of knowledge is all about connecting things. And uh, yeah, having contributed to several Dutch Transcribus projects, Helene combines her technical expertise with a background in Egyptology to innovate and preserve cultural heritage, demonstrating a unique blend of historical passion and digital innovation. Then we have uh, two uh, members of the Transcribus team, um, one of whom you have already had the pleasure of listening to during uh, yesterday's R&D keynote, Michael Lustoszewski. He is our head of research and development and a data scientist with a background in translation studies and computational linguistics. His main responsibility is uh, the management of scouting, testing, and further developing technologies that at some point end up in the Transcribus user interface. This includes uh, handwritten text recognition, natural language processing pipelines, and visual analysis techniques. And last but not least, another team member, Gregor Lanzinger, to the very uh, right, stage right. Uh, he is our uh, chief te uh, technology officer uh, at the Reed Cooperative and an open source enthusiast. He is passionate, uh, he's a passionate advocate for open source principles at the company as well. His interests extend into the realm of large language models, reflecting his fascination with artificial intelligence and its potential to revolutionize our interaction with information enhance problem solving and shape a more informed and innovative future, especially when it comes to historical documents. So those are our panelists. And um, now let's uh, take a quick look at uh, what we are uh, going to do here or what the structure uh, of this round table is going to be. Uh, here again, you see um, the panelists and uh, institutions that are represented here on this uh, at this round table. Uh, the, the principle here will be that we're going to do short uh, kickoff talks, uh, which will be followed by discussions where we will discuss among ourselves or the panelists among themselves. Uh, and we will also involve you, the audience. And uh, the third part then is uh, your chance to shape the future role of LLMs and Transcribus, because we are going to do a survey in the future uh, about how we are going to incorporate LLMs uh, in transcri uh, into Transcribus. And uh, we want your help to build this survey. So it's a meta survey, if you, uh, if you will. <laughs> Good, yeah, so then, David, if you would do the honors, uh, let's have our first um, kickoff talk. And David will tell you a little bit about how he's been using uh, LLMs in his work. Okay, thanks for the, thanks for the introduction. Um, 
we've been using transcribers for many years and like many people we've ended up with a large amount of text in our case it's about 60 or 70 million words which has ended up certainly since 2021 basically hanging around the place like a teenager getting busy not doing very very much at all from what we can see and we were beginning to actually wonder about how much more text we were going to generate on the basis that we weren't using a lot of the text that we already had. And then in March of last year, our transcribers text finally got a job and we could make it go out and do something. Uh, transcribers and GPT-4, which is what we use, we don't use the free to wear cheap ones. There's a reason why the cheap, the ones you pay for, are actually better. Uh, Gemini, which has also just been released, probably has similar capabilities, but everything you're going to see has been generated through GPT-4. Um, Pilea was introduced as a GitHub in so 2017, and the original algorithm developed by Google Labs, which which introduced the world to Transformers, was also introduced in 2017. And the GPTs are based on this original Transformer research. The Transformer research is a language translation tool. So the GPTs basically also work as language translation tools. So the closer you bring your work to language translation, the better and more consistent results you're going to get. When you start picking stuff out of the internet and using generative AI, that's when you have the problems. But if you start off with a translation-based approach, and that's either translating from one language to another, from one version of one language to another, from a human language to a machine language, like asking it to produce code, you tend to get very effective results. So we'll start off with something pretty easy, considering my colleagues. We have a large collection of, I think we have 20,000 Dutch pamphlets in Trinity. So... They're in the process of being digitized. They're in the process of being cataloged. Nobody in Trinity, bar one or two scholars, speak any Dutch at all. We just ran it through in the normal way using Transcribers Print. We produced a perfectly reasonable HGR result. Still of no use to us. Maybe it's of use to my colleagues in the Netherlands, but none of our students can read this. So we put it into ChatGPT. We asked it to produce a translation in modern English. It took out all the flowery early modern stuff like, you know, here, I, you, trust you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and gave a sort of summarized English language version of the original pamphlet. It was checked by a couple of scholars who can read both, I can't, which is a first little ethical pitfall that we have because I'm now working with a text that I don't understand the original of. And this translation step normally... People don't even notice when I do this in presentations. They go, oh, that's good, because they're used to translation. But you're already moving into this world of the machine has done something. You don't know what it's done, and you do not have the capability to question what it's done. And you'll simply move forward now, which we will do. As our American friends say, we're going to put a pin in this. We're going to come back to this text in a couple of minutes, but we're going to go and look at some other examples. These are real-world examples of what we've been doing with GPT-4. Everything you're about to see has been replicated, so it's not a kind of prompt lucky dip, which is what these things can often degenerate into. Uh, this is a poor Latin calendar of a document that was destroyed we don't have the original of. The Latin is badly written. There's a lot of abbreviation in it. It often contains mixes of Old English words, Old Irish words, sometimes a bit of Norman French when they're quoted from a legal document. Um, the handwriting is poor. The model that it was made for didn't use any Latin characters. There's no ligatures in it. There's no special characters in it. It produces a straight bad transcription, which you would wonder if there's any point in trying to fix up. There isn't actually. But we put this into the translation program with a few rules that we always introduce keep the place names the same, expand the abbreviated personal names, expand the abbreviated words, make sure you put all the office holders and positions into full. And it produces a excellent English, modern English version of that terrible Latin text. So we've jumped a few steps in one go. We're not even trying to translate a good Latin text. We're trying to translate a terrible Latin text. And it's produced a very good English language version, which we can then do entity extraction on, and so on and so forth. This is an example of a 17th century English parliamentary diary. It's the appointment of a parliamentary committee. And again, we've used one of our early modern English transcriptions. We haven't bothered correcting it. It's come out perfectly well. 
We've told ChatGPT that this is an English House of Commons from 1642 document naming a committee. So we've given it a bit of background. And what I've also told is that I wanted to extract the names, which you can take in as read. It's really good at extracting names. You don't need to demonstrate it. But I also want it as a slide for PowerPoint. And I'd like to have a few words of background biographical detail for each of the people that it, it extracts. And I want to have this sort of bibliographical data because we do a lot of work with archives and archivists. And one of the things that we like to do is to produce these 30 word summaries, 12 word titles, extract date and so on. It's really, really good at this. We've done thousands of these now from different types of documents. And you can basically just run your way through them. It tends to work best on chunks of text of about 400 words. Don't know why, they won't tell us. Um, you tend to do about 30 at a time with GPT-4, and then you have to wait. And this means you're doing about 9,000 words in the morning and 9,000 words in the afternoon that have to be checked, which is fine. You can just about read through it, and that's basically your workflow, because there's no point in cracking the stuff out automatically and throwing it into a catalog. It has to be checked. So automating it further, we found there's no point to it. So we produce our and again, it's fine. It would have taken me 20 minutes to produce that from what was originally a three-page document. And then it produces, it does a extraction of subjects and it produces Mark and Dewey decimal codes if you're a library or if you're an archive. We check the codes to check for hallucinations and the codes are fine. We've done a few where they've been wrong, but we've been getting a accuracy rate of about 95%, which is probably okay for a not terribly well-trained library assistant anyway, whose stuff would also have to be checked before it goes into the catalog. So as an assistant, again, this is a very useful thing that it does. This is my slide. And the biographical information, I don't know if you can, you can just about read it. It's basically extracted all the names in that original document. It's given their full titles. It's given you their full first names, where Robert might have been R-O-B full stop. Mm -hmm. And the little biographies it's produced are actually very good. We don't think they're Wikipedia. We think they're from History of Parliament, which is a bit more authoritative but there's no way of knowing. But for a slide, for a presentation, it's great. Very good for students as well, so just to be able to quickly see and to visualize their own work. A lot of time was spent making slides, and actually we find that any of us in the history department could have produced the biographical data very quickly, but it takes us ages to make nicely laid out slides. So just having it produce the slide in itself is a useful thing that it does. This is from the 1641 depositions, and this is a collection of verbatim transcripts by normal, ordinary people. So this is one of the very few examples we have of how English was spoken by <clears throat> regular folk in the 17th century, as opposed to prepared speeches or trained text or things that have been cleaned up later on. And again, we've used this for entity extraction before in a previous project from the original text using Spacey and various NLP tools and so on a few years ago. And again, we wanted to see how well this might work. So again, we've done the translation step. This is the original text. This is the translated text. And we've asked to do a close word-to-word -word translation, not a summary like it did with the original Dutch document. So the all of the words have been translated into modern English. The grammar has been corrected into contemporary English, and it's correcting the grammar that enables the NLP to work so well. And we asked it to produce a table to do the entity extraction, we wanted first name, we wanted surname, we wanted rights and occupations, we wanted gender, and we wanted the relationship between people mentioned in the text. And it has done all this perfectly. And in the total document, there was about 42 people mentioned that we ran through in blocks of 400 words at a time out of a 2,000 word document. We then later on tried to assign CDOC CRM codes to the, the, to the relationships wasn't great at that, but by when we put in a training table of this relationship codes that we wanted, it did it perfectly well, because it has generated this text so it knows what this text is. Again, as a time saver, it's excellent. Um, we could find no reason not to use this in a much more general way, which we will do. Uh, this is kind of last, I think it's our last big text example. This is to extract place names from a deed. It's quite challenging because the county, which is a upper administrative level in Ireland, is mentioned at the beginning. There's a lower administrative level mentioned at the end, and then the small parcels of land are mentioned in the middle of the block of text. And we wanted it to produce a 
hierarchical table of the text. So that went the lowest denomination over to the right, which it did. So it managed to interpret the text, it managed to produce a, hierarch a hierarchical table. We then matched the place names against the table from the Ordnance Survey, so which you referenced, and we can just bang it into my maps or whatever. Uh, now we go back to our original document that we were looking at, and remember we had that, that summary in English. Uh, Joe Clark is the head of the history department in Trinity College Dublin, and we uploaded one of his articles and asked ChatGPT to do a linguistic analysis of his writing. What we were trying to do was show that you cannot detect when students plagiarize using ChatGPT. So it did a linguistic analysis of his writing. We uploaded the translation that ChatGPT had done, asked it to write basically a normal student type of presentation essay. And it did a really good job. This is, this is, Joe, this is Joe's text. Um, Joe uses a lot of proverbs and examples of what's happening on the ground locally. And this is what it produced. And it's put a Dutch proverb in the middle. And every reference is actually very good. And if a student gave it to you, you'd go, that's fine. Read that out in the tutorial and we'll discuss it later. There's nothing wrong with it. It is historically accurate. It quotes from the original document, which is what you want it to do. It's put in a proverb. It does everything you want. And then finally, for our last slide, because why not, we asked it to produce a painting of the essay. Um, admittedly, Charles II looks a little bit like Jesus. It based the painting on the proverb, the Dutch proverb, uh, Beth Helsman stands on shore. And we asked it to produce in the style of a Dutch master. And that is where we will finish with some of the capabilities that we've been using. Oh. Thanks a lot. Yeah, as you can see, there's lots of fun things that you can do um, in a post-processing workflow after uh, you have transcribed the text with uh, transcribers. Um, yeah. In, uh, in one sentence, David, what would be, what would you say are the main strengths that you uh, see in the LLMs in your workflows? Um, we've only used one, seriously. We experimented with the other ones and found they weren't as good, so why bother? We find that it's basically helpful as a research assistant. If you ask it the kind of questions you would ask a research assistant in exactly the same way, you can coax it into doing what you want and to replicate those tasks quite quickly. So really it's a productivity tool and that's how we look at it. It doesn't replace people. It doesn't do things that we can't do. It doesn't do things as well as most of us would do things, but it does speed things up and there's no doubt about it. it these, these are useful tools once you get the hang of them and the best way to get the hang of them is to play with them. Okay, thank you. So are there any comments from the audience? Thank you, David, for your uh, very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, given the um, yeah the pretty good results that you had with uh, using the uh, Chat GPT or what, GPT four in in translating from let's say poorly transcribed text to pretty legible and and good quality text, did you play around with the settings in the playground? Did you play around with temperature and top P, top K, etc. to to get these results and get get the hallucination? out or to a limited level? No, we only gave it conventions. We just told about how we wanted various mm -hmm. nouns, sorry, various things like people in place to be represented. Um, there are a few terms that are specific to Ireland, particularly to do with places, and we had to tell them that this particular word means whatever it meant. But other than that, no, very little, probably a 200 word setting. And then we just let it go. It seemed to learn as we went along, because when we started doing that in July with those inquisitions, they're a very important source for us. Um, when it did an update, in, I think in September, it didn't need that pre-prompt anymore when we started a new job. It seemed to have, because it doesn't just what you what users put into it, which we're perfectly happy for it to do, because we're publicly funded, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, we did find that it improved over the course of six months, yeah. as they did upgrades, they were, in, they were putting in obviously what we were asking you to do, and many, of course, others around the world. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you for this very interesting question. Um, parameterization actually is also a very hot topic when it comes to product development uh, in Transcribus because we don't want to overwhelm users with too many parameters. On the other side, we also don't want to hide them too much for, from them. So uh, combining the, those more advanced use cases with an easy to learn and easy to work with uh, user interface, uh, that's actually uh, uh, yeah one of our main challenges. And uh, yeah, keep that one in mind for the questions later on. Uh, so you can uh, yeah put that into the survey then. Good, um, yeah, I think we, we have to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, so I would like the colleagues from the Amsterdam City Archives uh, to come up, or Nick, I think you will be talking, and to tell us a little bit about uh, what you've been up to and thinking about when it comes to large language models. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, no, after seeing similar examples uh, David gave us uh, over a year ago, our main focus is how can we bring this into production? Uh, and uh, we uh, took uh, one of our workflows within the uh, City Archive, which is uh, uh, making indices on sources uh, with a lot of uh, person observations. Now, in the past 25 years, we uh, made, made over 25 million uh, person ob observations, uh, first through outsourcing and after that through crowdsourcing. Uh, but it's a lot of work. Uh, a lot of people work on it, uh, hundreds of volunteers, and uh, you have to uh, make choices on one, what to indices. Do we only take the names or do we also take the occupations or other um, um, uh, yeah, uh, data that is in the sources? Um, and because of it's uh, that much of work, there's one big hiatus in our uh, data set, and that's the civil registry, one of the most important genealogical sources we have. Um, why is it a hiatus? It's because it's so much. It's 280 meters, over 8,000 registers, over 3 million deeds of birth, merits, and death, and over 18 million estimated persons mentioned in these deeds. Um, the past year, we've been working on making a pipeline uh, using Transcribus, OpenAI, and our own uh, collection management system to uh, indices these 18 million persons in uh, just a click of a button. And uh, that's what I'm going to show you next. Uh, this is the, the pipeline. There's a small video that demonstrates hope oh, it starts. Right. Yeah. Well, um, we're at the moment we're working on transcribing all the registers with uh, Transcribus, uh, and then with this uh, pipeline, we get the transcription from uh, the Transcribus AP, uh, API, and with the good prompt, uh, I've been yeah tweaking this prompt for for weeks and weeks. Uh, you can get a really nice, clear, structured data set from this, uh, this piece of text. Um, uh, you have to give a lot of uh, parameters. You, uh, nah. uh, I gave it the instruction to don't change the, the text data, et cetera, and which labels I want to use. And after that, this string of text is made into a JSON uh, object, and we can reuse that to make records in our collection management system. Um, so, and here you go. There we have a record for Johannes de Vos. Born on the 24th of May, 1916, at the Pieter Langedijkstraat, number 20, and uh, this is showing that our collection management system is capable of linking uh, people to other um, knowledge graphs, uh, such as Wikidata. And uh, now I'm 
planning to do something of uh, with uh, uh, graph algorithms to also automatically link all these persons to other knowledge graphs, but that's uh, for the future. So that was my small presentation of what is capable with these technology. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Wow, um, looks like um, LLMs uh, really are becoming part of the staff, it looks like. Would you say uh, that's an accurate statement? Yeah, yeah well, um, I think uh, LLMs, um, yeah, are uh, way better in extracting information than, than all the other uh, natural language processing uh, uh, tools we've seen. Um, and um, they are also more user-friendly because you only have to tweak your prompt to, uh, um, yeah, to, do, to, to get a, a good result. Um, yeah, I've also been working with named entity recognition as, uh, as, as part of this and never got a better result than 92%, but this is, is uh, getting almost 100, so, yeah. But um, would you say you get the feeling that uh, it's becoming part of the team, or do you rather see it as a tool? No, it's a tool. Okay. Any other statements from the archivists on the panel? Helene, Pauline, what would you say? Well, I just love his pipeline. <laughs> I would like to have it too in Utrecht, but we have a different system. And we were discussing yesterday also over dinner that uh, the prompts, uh, asking the, uh, the right prompts is so important. And um, I know Nick and we uh, update each other, but um, yeah, I would also love to see his prompts, but also from other people in the audience to maybe that's something also worth uh, sharing to learn from each other. Thank you. Yeah, because this was actually a question that we asked uh, one and a half years ago uh, on a panel that was on AI in general. And there we were talking a little bit about, um, yeah, is uh, is AI becoming um, part of the gang, basically? Or uh, do we rather see it as a tool? Um, I don't know what the, what the general um, feeling is when it comes to that. Are there any comments from the audience? What would you say? Where is this going? Do you feel it's already like working with someone instead of something? Who wants to go? No one? Hi. So when I've used it, I think when using it to do extremely structured things, so not treating it as a person, but treating it as an information processing thing that's taken one pot of information and putting it into different formats, not actually asking it to infer too much or change the data, but just restructuring it. And I, I echo Helene's point about understanding the prompts that people are using to make sure that they can trace back. Because I think the danger is when Excuse me. When when we ask it to infer or change too much, and we can't understand the pipeline, but if we have clear processing instructions where we can understand how it's taking one bit of data and turning it into a different structure, then it's incredibly useful for the type of data that we need to do to build these online systems. Okay, thank you. So it looks like the the general consensus seems to be rather that it's more than a tool than a a um, yeah. Um, Team member, Dave, you wanted yeah. to come in? I found interacting with it that when I felt I was in charge, that I was the domain expert, I treated it as a, an assistant or a piece of software. When I was asking it to do things I didn't know how to do, like write a Python script or automate something, I found I was much more talking to it like another person or a teacher, and it was talking back to me. It did get a bit snippy. I would have to say that we were not friends, but we were colleagues for this particular Python writing exercise. Okay, yeah, very nice. And um, yeah, you don't need to be friends with all of your colleagues, right? <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, what do the the tech guys say, or the what? Are, uh, I mean, the the developers. I'm interested in um, 
in the question if it changes your workflow, your the profiles needed from your employees, because um, for me, you have to look for other kinds of uh, mistakes you are doing with um, if you're working together with with uh, the ChatGPT or other AIs. And I see it more less like a tool, so often like somebody <laughs> I talk to regarding that question. Yes. Okay, so it's not not that clear cut after all. Okay, yeah, let's let's keep moving on. And uh, I'm asking you, Helene, yes. to tell a little bit about your work. But I also um, decided to improvise because I'm really curious also about the people here. So uh, who uh, already used LLMs like ChatGPT on Transcribus material, did some experimenting? Well, that's quite a few already. And who used it in general, not necessarily Transcribus? A lot more. Great to know. Um, yes, uh, I'll keep it very short because we saw already great examples. And um, I uh, completely agree with Andy uh, uh, yesterday said uh, with a quote that if you want to innovate, you do it together. So that's also what we did at the Utrecht archives where I work. So when ChatGPT uh, came out um, already a couple of months later in February, we had, we had a session with about 40 heritage professionals to share experiences, prompts. And uh, I think that's also great that we're doing that uh, here today. Next slide, please. Yes, um, so we do similar things that we uh, saw from the others, uh, a little bit less sophisticated. Uh, uh, it's not a complete pipeline, um, but for example, here you have a Dutch notarial deed um, where uh, my colleague that you saw in the previous slide, Rick, he created with uh, Transcribus a transcription using the uh, Dutch's one model. Then by a human uh, a specialist, uh, we had it improved. So that's also an important thing. Uh, what do you do with the uh, quality uh, control and where in your pipeline are you doing that? And then the improved version. Next slide, please. Uh, he asked uh, ChatGPT, and it was the 3.5 version, uh, to answer questions and give it back in a JSON format, the things that people have been doing, experts, for many years uh, to making our uh, notarial deeds accessible. So uh, that's uh, uh, quite similar to, to what we already saw. So who are the, uh, the key players? Uh, what are their roles? Um, when was it written? Where? Give abstract. And I think also seeing uh, David's presentation, it's interesting also um, whether you first translate and then do the extraction or whether you do it from the original source and you want the original spelling. So uh, that kept me also thinking about uh, yeah, how to, uh, to make your pipeline uh, and in what order to do what. And then I give the floor to Nick. Yes because uh, these things are very great, um, but also come with some, some or maybe a lot of risks. Uh, these are just some uh, headlines I found on the internet. Uh, uh, besides all the uh, misleading and, and um, nah, uh, fear of AI taking over the world, uh, they also have an uh, impact on our, our environment. Uh, they are trained on uh, a lot of copyrighted data. Um, and uh, we don't know what all these big tech companies are doing with the data we put through them. So um, these are some things we are going to ask you some questions about uh, further on. Um, now, nah. uh, I don't know the, the right answer of uh, um, how uh, and, and whether we should use the, these these uh, uh, these technologies, uh, but there are some uh, studies uh, already available or which uh, compare uh, different uh, models and different uh, technologies. And um, can you move this? Yes, this this one. Uh, was done by uh, Stanford and they uh, checked whether these models are compli uh, complying 
with the draft EU AI Act that uh, passed uh, yeah, last year. Um, and you see that none of them uh, complies uh, wholly with this, this with the values we ha uh, and that we as uh, a European Union have um, stated that AI technology should uh, comply comply with. Um, moreover, uh, our AI team at the, the uh, municipality of Amsterdam did their own research uh, study yeah, research on. Uh, yeah, a, com a comparative research to to models uh they left out the more um uh the parts of copyrighted data and energy use etc but they looked at the addicts and the uh um, yeah outcomes of the of the of the model can you move on um now these are the criteria where they which they uh scored on um because yeah, we at the municipality of Amsterdam are uh, thinking of a way, how can we um, make a choice uh, if we want to use this technology, um, uh, which one should we use for what purpose? And um, uh, so you can say that if there is a high risk of um, uh, processing personal data um, and making uh, decisions about people, uh, uh, the use of these technologies uh, uh, will not be uh, allowed. But if there's uh, not such a risk and you're working with uh, open data, uh, maybe it, 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 it can be uh, a very uh, helpful. So um, at the, the, this was the result of the, uh, the Amsterdam study in which you see that um, for Dutch, because uh, they worked with Dutch uh, prompts and Dutch data, um, there are only nah, two, maybe three models that uh, really work. And um, the most, yeah, the, the difficult problem is that uh, only one, and that's, the GPT uh, 3.5 Turbo is, uh, uh, yeah, usable on a large scale. So, having seen this, um, we have some questions for you, and I think I'm going to give the mic to Pauline, or to to do these questions. Uh, yes. <laughs> I don't have a screen, but... <laughs> Sorry, Helene is uh, the next speaker. Yeah, Thank you. Goes back to Helene first. Yes, and um, I, I really uh, recognize what Nick is saying. Um, what I see is that in the Netherlands, uh, as here also, most people are using uh, OpenAI to experiment or already to implement. But I heard often uh, that there's a need for an alternative, and I completely agree with that. And we are very happy that in the Netherlands, there's a now a more open initiative that's trying to be very transparent and fair. It's called GPTNL. And a couple of weeks ago, again, we put together the people from GPTNL and heritage experts to see how we can work together and also train it on historic data and for what use cases. And I think this is something that you see uh, worldwide, but especially in several uh, European countries. And I think for me, that would be also really interesting to not uh, only look at uh, open AI uh, options to integrate in Transcribus, but also look at these more fair uh, models uh, and hopefully also a little bit smaller and more efficient, uh, because I think uh, there's a need uh, for that. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, this is the next thing. Mm, yeah, maybe let's go back one slide. Uh, keep this one up for now. Um, yeah, so mm, I think what we uh, what we've just seen is that one um, overarching topic here is tool chains and and workflows. So stringing things together in the right way. This is something that we also discussed during the uh, R and D keynote. And um, yeah. I think uh, it's it's not as easy 
anymore uh, as it was a couple of years ago when it was more about the technology. Now it's more about um, putting technologies together. So this collaborative element between um, uh, yeah, code components basically uh, is gaining more and more uh, importance. I don't know what would our R&D uh, department say. I will just show the next slide because there we have some answers to it. <laughs> is the mic on? I would have suggested to just show the next slide okay. because we are yeah. dealing with those issues on, on the next slide. Actually. Yeah, we're a bit short on time anyway. Um, so I think, yeah, just let's go to the next slide and uh, take a quick look at what we've been up to uh, at the cooperative in terms of preparing, researching, testing the use of LLMs. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Exactly, as, as we mentioned yesterday in the keynote, um, we made experiments with unsupervised uh, entity extraction and entity tagging. And here, our major concern was really to um, standardize prompts that work well across multiple data sets and scenarios. So we wanted to get away from this copying back and forth transcripts uh, from transcribus to uh, chat GPT and tinkering around with prompts. We wanted to, um, yeah, validate those prompts. And for this task, it is crucial to have benchmarking data sets. So before we can really um, start, um, yeah, experimenting, we need a robust databases with a solid ground truth data. Then we can really go ahead and um, find out which prompt combinations work best. Um, in this first task that we explored, the unsupervised entity tagging, um, we devised a series of experiments that um, tested different scenarios, uh, for example, single shot versus multi-shot and few shot example feeding into the prompt. We experimented with single uh, prompts versus chain of thought experiments. Chain of thought refers to a technique where um, the LLM is prompted to provide um, a um, hypothesis like an um, temporary output and then to revise step by step in a systematic and analytic manner the output to correct itself and this yielded relatively good results according to the two benchmarking data sets that we used but only with gpt4 gpt3.5 and all open source uh, solutions were not capable of dealing with those complex prompt structures um yeah and the last bullet point on this slide highlights uh, the main challenge that we see in order to reasonably work um, with unsupervised LLM extraction as an alternative to straightforward supervised approaches. We really need to um, focus on ground truth quality. We need benchmarking data sets. Um, and some further applications that we would like to explore apart from unsupervised information extraction our language modernization, this has arose quite some times in the discussions already, uh, language translation, so from one variant to another. Um, event extraction would be really interesting. Um, document understanding with a wide, wide variety of subtasks would be cool, and we have put it on our to-do list. And HDR post-processing is also something that we want to explore. But um, yeah, we have one, well, a series of challenges and probably the best or one of the most viable ways to approach those challenges would be to work on self-hosted open source models that we can tune and optimize with the data, with the historic data that is available in our ground truth collections. And regarding the challenges, Gregor is going to tell a few words. Yeah. So why Gregor is moving up to the microphone, um, I think, yeah, what we can see here too is uh, right in line with uh, this tool chain uh, idea, um, uh, which means that things uh, have got a little bit more complicated because um, as opposed to like HDR, where you do more of the same until it gets better. So you just produce ground truth until you see, okay, uh, I'm reaching the, the CR level that I want. Um, it's besides stringing together the right tools, one of which is HTR, it's also about uh, the usage of those tools. So um, using them in the right way 
and tinkering with them. And I think this is a phenomenon that uh, is typical of any new technology. So at first, there is no standardized way of doing things. And uh, yeah, this poses many challenges. And Gregor, please tell us a little bit about those challenges. Yes. Um, I want to speak about um, the challenges we are facing when it comes to hosting our uh, LLMs on our uh, hardware. Uh, one of the ones um, Michael already mentioned is um, we need to find a solution for resource-friendly implementation. One way would be, for example, to have models which have a very good ground roof. This would mean we could reduce the number of parameters in the end uh, to up to a factor of 100, which would make it easier to run the models. Another possibility would be in this context for example, to use techniques uh, like quantization and that stuff. I want. To, I don't want to dive too deep into that. Uh, then, um, obviously, we need uh, much more in-house resources in, the, in terms of GPU power for that, because uh, already now we are running on the on the higher end of what our hardware is able to process, and, um, and also expertise is needed because this is a relatively new topic. And uh, our resources are limited, but I think this is also a possibility for us to grow. And um, it's very plausible that this technique uh, plays an, uh, an important role in future. So I think this would be uh, something to invest. And then um, when it comes to data, uh, this is something we do already now, uh, but it's important to to um, to do it also in future is the transparency when it comes to the training and fine tuning of the models and obviously the control of the training data, which is more, which is diff different than it is now. And uh, Michael mentioned already the benchmarking. Uh, there we have the, there we have a lot of expert knowledge uh, for use case validation, um, for prompt validation, and for standardization. And um, then for us, it's also interesting if we can combine uh, our existing techniques, techniques or different um, kind of expert models uh, in LL with LLMs so that we, we have a workflow like Google is doing with BART a bit in this direction. And obviously, the, one of the, or the, the biggest problems are the alignment problem. Because um, as we heard uh, today in the first talk, um, in the past, the, the words had a different meaning. And so uh, <laughs> this maybe also has to be considered in training and into the process, depending on what you do. Um, and obviously the hallucinations, because we don't want to rewrite our past. Thank you. Quick question. <laughs> Right. Thank you. A uh, quick question right off the bat. Uh, could you explain uh, a little bit more uh, what uh, the alignment means? Because I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with this term. Alignment uh, means nowadays a lot. Uh, there is uh, things which are not politically correct, on the other hand, but also the alignment with uh, the intentions you have. And uh, when it comes to language, then um, it makes a difference. I mean, you as linguist, uh, yeah. you know, uh, that uh, different phrasing can change a lot of the meaning. And uh, this is a very big um, concept. And uh, it's, I think it's very difficult to train because in the end, uh, if I would have to find an alignment on certain topics with Michael, it would be straight impossible perhaps. <laughs> so. Uh, to find a model which is in alignment with everybody of us, with the society, I think this is uh, one of the biggest challenges, but this is way bigger. Okay. Yeah, so we're right back uh, on the topic of culture. So um, there will probably be uh, culture-specific LLMs, mm, yeah, which will be used in different contexts. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, let's move to the to the last segment, uh, which is again a bit more interactive. Uh, yeah, let's build a survey together. Uh, here's the the QR code from the beginning again. I hope you all still have the uh, survey, the meta survey open. Uh, if you haven't, then here's the QR code again. If you want to go there again, uh, 
um, because we have a couple of questions about questions, basically, for you. Everybody ready? Yeah, I think we can move on. And here's the first question. Areas of interest. What are areas related to the integration of LLMs into Transcribus, um, yeah, uh, which are the uh, ones that you're most interested in or concerned about? These could range from technical challenges to ethical considerations. Please just type in your answers. You will, uh, they will come up here on screen. And you can also upload the um, uh, responses uh, from others. Uh, and in the meantime, while we're on the topic of ethical considerations, um, yeah, since uh, I was asking whether uh, LLMs are becoming part of the team, um, I don't know what are the, the archivists saying. Do you get the feeling that they are replacing um, human labor? I don't know, Pauline. No, they're complementing. They're doing the boring parts, and I think uh, it leaves us humans for the for the juicy bits. Okay, yeah, that's. I think that's. Uh... And if there's, if I can add, if there's one thing I learned, uh, I think I also saw it this morning and also yesterday, uh, that algorithms are uh, generic. So if they find something unusual, they will label it as a mistake. Um, but humans will know that they struck gold. And that's still a difference. And I, I'm really curious if that would be changed in the next uh, Transcribers conference. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a very cool detail to, to think about. Because, I mean, one, um, one main issue here is uh, who is better at what? And, yeah, who is better suited to which tasks? Yeah, and we are seeing the, the answers coming in. Very nice. Yeah, correction of HTR text, for example. Info extraction, the main topic of our conference. Structuring of data. Yeah, prompt engineering. We are going to ask you about that as well. Yeah, I um, think a lot of good stuff. And we are going to use all of that and look all at all of that later. Then uh, second question, specific challenges or opportunities. Are there specific challenges or opportunities you believe should be explored through the survey? regarding LLM integration in Transcribus. For example, what types of problems could be addressed with LLMs? What could have a positive impact on LLM uh, integration? So are there anything, uh, any things that you think may be problematic or beneficial for the integration of LLMs? I think we can overrun a couple of minutes. So the official time of this session is up, but um, yeah, there's three more questions and then let's hope we can collect a lot of good uh, feedback. I don't know, what do the audience say? Are there any challenges that you would like to say a couple of words about or any opportunities? What do you think? Well, this is really something that's going to make LLM integration in Transcribus a good thing. Any thoughts? Or from the panelists? Or anything where you think this is going to be hard? Understanding the corpus, which LLMs are based on, yeah. Um, which goes in the direction of uh, explainability. Um, yeah, accountability as well. Transparency, I think this is a huge uh, topic. Mentioning of, mentioning of sources goes in the same direction. Historical language differences. Will it be able, able to overcome them? Yeah, this is a challenge. And we've heard it before during this conference. Data protection, yeah, which is an ethical issue as well. But let's move on. Desired outcomes or improvements. How would LLM integration into Transcribus make your life better. Which topics should we talk about in the in the survey when it comes to desired outcomes? So, what are you wishing for? Named entity recognition, everybody's favorite. <laughs> it's uh, something that everybody understands, and that's provi that provides huge um, value. Efficiency, yeah, saving time. I don't know any comments from the audience or the panelists. 
feel free to raise your hand at any point if you want to comment on any of the questions. Yes, Helene. I think it's also really interesting on uh, what we saw yesterday in Kirsten's presentation about how sites is better developing because we're doing it uh, do, uh, for opening our archives. Um, and if you have the, the tagging and maybe also the identification with the Wikidata to enrich your sources and make that also uh, online available and searchable. So I think that's really interesting on the, yeah, how okay. to make it available. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, availability, that's one of the core topics of, of Transcribus, obviously, because bringing the technology to the users, that's been our main goal from right from the start. So um, then practical applications and use cases. Yeah, what pra practical applications do you see in Transcribus? And do you, th uh, do you, th you think are crucial um, to investigate through out the survey, yeah, name entity recognition. <laughs> Someone wants to make it really clear that we need name entity recognition. I mean, we're working on it anyway. Part of speech tagging, cool. Yeah, this may be very interesting to our uh, linguist crowd. Yeah, link to open data. Yeah, improving the search options. Yeah, that's a very nice thing. Very nice practical thing because we have, or we already have an, an AI based um, search feature which is called Smart Search, which basically just extends the the search space to less well ranked um, variants of um, how the AI reads the words. So not just the best rank candidate, but all the words that it thinks this could be the word at this place. Um, but yeah, with LLMs you could obviously do a lot in terms of search as well. Yeah, language translation, that's a frequent one, I think. Scribe recognition, recognition. Mm -hmm. very interesting. Not sure if LLMs will be best suited, but um, at least on a more abstract level with stylometry. So um, identifying authorship by looking at how a text is written, not necessarily what the handwriting looks like. Very cool, so there's tons of stuff in there. And then we have ethical and societal implica uh, implications. What do you think uh, do we need to ask you about when it comes to, to ethical things? So what broad topics do you think are there? For example, one we've been discussing leading up to uh, or during the preparations of this uh, round table, data protection, data protection, I don't know. Data protection, anyone? <laughs> Yeah, that's obviously very, very, a very important consideration. But also, I think, um, yeah, job security may maybe we discussed this topic before the roundtable um, a little bit. Um, yeah, we've already alluded to it a little bit here today as well. I don't know, David, what do you think? I was actually having a, a vague forward thought about entity extraction. And at what point will that become essentially something in the background that we're not actually very interested in? Because one of the features of large language models is to produce text that lets you communicate with people, either as blog posts or articles or poems or sonnets or whatever it is. And my thought was maybe we are focusing very heavily on entity extraction being the theme of the conference, but maybe at the next conference we might go, yeah, we've kind of done that now. But this is what we're actually using our historical text for. It's for explaining and helping the public understand the past in simple or complex, but easy to understand and targeted language. Yeah. Yeah, so um, accessibility is an important topic, I think. So because just because you can read a text um, through HDR, that doesn't mean that you can understand it. And even if it's translated into modern day language, that doesn't mean that you will understand it either. Um, but turning, returning more to the ethical and societal implications, I mean, this is a societal topic as well, uh, because making um, history explainable, I think that's a, a huge topic, especially nowadays with everything that's going on with social media and um, yeah, um, false information, basically, that's being uh, spread throughout, throughout social media. Uh, with, uh, yeah increasingly increasingly well we have to say because those messages look increasingly more uh, convincing and real 
um, yeah, uh, there it's very important to um, be able to interpret how things were before and what led up to the situation or situations that we find ourselves in. So what led to a certain political information uh, situation and we why we are at each other other's uh, throats on social media when uh, when there's the slightest hint of a political topic. Okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of good stuff there. Can I? Can I? Can yeah. I? Uh, there's another qu- at one comment. point. Yeah, because um, now my, my personal uh, biggest concern with these technologies is the second one, environmental concerns. And I have thought this over very good, but um what i'm thinking of is that uh having access to technology um if we um should see it as a, a ground right just as having access to food uh to healthcare to uh housing um is it possible to um see uh, no, to to, to collaborate to to get together to make these technologies as uh, um, efficient and um, uh, less uh, harmful uh, as they can. And what I wanted to say uh, today here on this conference is that I think that Transcribus as a cooperative tech platform could be an example uh, for establishing this on a much greater scale than only um, uh, within the uh, heritage sector, but um, yeah, I don't know how. But I, I would really like to uh, think about how we can uh, work together to to have a, a, a cooperative plat- platform to um, um, make tech more um, sustainable. Cool. Yeah, I think those are. This is a very uh, nice thought to to round out uh, this session. I mean, Transcribus and uh, the Read Cooperative are all about collaboration, and also our community is so diverse. It's it's amazing. Um, I didn't expect to to learn of uh, many new uh, parts of the community or specialties, basically, of people and every. Uh, other month or so someone new comes along um yeah uh, i don't know um i'm in education or uh, i do art for example that's also what i learned uh, at this conference here that people are using transcribers to do art which just blew my mind uh and i think this is also uh, in the future of transcribers um uh, so this will uh, continue to to increase even more. So there are going to be more and more people from more and more diverse backgrounds. And uh, I mean, documents is where we used to store our information for centuries or millennia and also a couple of decades ago. So I think also more recent information is going to get more and more relevant um, for transcribers. So yeah, thanks a lot. Here, you can sign up for the survey once it comes out. So if you want to take the survey and see how many of your thoughts have made it in, made it into the question uh, questions or catalog of questions? Then please uh, use this QR code. Best take a photo of it so you can use it later. Um, yeah, and can I ask one more thing? Sign up right away. Yeah, very sure. lasting. <laughs> one minute. If we're all sharing, um, we as I think we are more of data users and data suppliers. And I'm happy to hear that you're experimenting with all the kind of things and you have a different view. Uh, so will you be willing to share it um, like in blog posts or? Um, yes. Okay. You have a completely different view, I think, on those. This is definitely something that we can so do. And so, ways. as you know, we like writing blog posts. So I think this is one of the next topics that you're going to see online. <laughs> Thanks for this amazing input.